Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, please join me in prayer. Father in heaven, we give thanks to you for blessing us with such a wonderful country, with blessing us with the freedoms we have to share together and worship. We thank you for sending your son, Christ Jesus, who has paid the price that we might have ultimate freedom through his death on the cross. And we pray that each day your Holy Spirit might give us, lead us, guide us, and direct us, that we might live as faithful people in this nation as we are preparing our hearts to join you forever in heaven. Until that day, may you guide us and direct us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Our text for the sermon this morning comes to us from Hebrews chapter 11, just the very end of our reading that's in your bulletin for today, and the very last verse in particular, where it talks about, and the ESV translate this, translates this, a better country, but we're going to talk about a more excellent country, as the Greek literally gives to us, a more excellent place, a more excellent, wonderful place. And today, as I think about that, as I thought about that a few days ago, I think about how many people come to America looking for a more excellent place. So many people from all over the globe, Mexico, China, from places we couldn't even find on the map, in Africa and Asia, people who are willing to be shipped into our country by cargo containers, where for maybe days and weeks, they can't even hardly breathe because there's no ventilation and they don't have any waste facilities. People who are willing to pay exorbitant amounts of money so they can join us in this more excellent place. People who are willing to do virtually anything so that they can become part of this more excellent country. And as you think about it, you probably know many people along the way, have known people who talk about their patriotism, have talked about what it means to be an American. Think about what, the freedoms that we have, the freedoms that we celebrate, what it means to say we're one nation under God. We know that those freedoms didn't come to us freely. We know that they had to be defended, that they had to be that by blood, sweat, and tears of men and even lives of men and women soldiers who gave their lives, that these freedoms were costly. But we enjoy those freedoms today. None of you worried this morning that you had to secretly come to church, did you? None of you are worried right now that someone's going to kick down the back door of the church and come in here with guns and make us all get on the floor and renounce our faith. We don't have to worry about that. In fact, our freedoms extend even beyond our worship. People can say terrible things, lies against our politicians, against those who serve in office. People can even stomp on our American flag and do it on TV without reprisal or set it on fire. We have a great amount of freedoms, don't we? I'm not saying that every one of those freedoms is necessarily one that we should indulge in, but there's a great amount of freedoms in this country, making it a more excellent country. Well, our early... Lutheran forefathers and foremothers felt the same way. Because as they came over here, they were seeking greater freedom. See, maybe you may or may not have known this, but when the Lutherans came to America, and this is, I'm right now just talking about the LCMS Lutherans, we'll come to the other ones in just a minute, they came because they were being persecuted. They were from a little area of Germany called Prussia and Saxony, right on the edge of Germany there. And in that area, rationalism had stuck in. Now, this is something that's not new for us, but rationalism is this idea that, well, we can explain everything, and what can't be explained? Well, it's not true. So if you look at the Bible with rationalistic eyes, you're going to say, well, could God create the world in seven days? Well, we can't fit it between our ears, so no. Could God rise from the grave? Could, well, could God take on human form? No. So there must be a rational explanation. And these Lutherans, the founders of the Missouri Synod, they didn't follow that line of thinking. They believed that what God's word said was truth. And still to this day, we hold to that very same promise. So in 1838, a bishop by the name of, of Martin Stephan led all these Lutherans uh, across the sea up to, to the uh, Mississippi River and into New Orleans where we left off a few Lutherans and then the rest came up to Perry County where we have the first Missouri Synod Lutherans in 1839. But actually... Honestly, Christians and Lutherans were coming to America long before that for freedom. In fact, some of the, some, we, we know for certain that within 20 years of the foundation of our country, there were already Lutherans here, but it's likely that there were those who fought in the Revolutionary War. Not just Lutherans, though. Many Christians fought in that war. They fought for a more excellent place. To f they fought for freedoms from persecution. They fought for opportunities to defend and to stand up for what they believed in. And they fought and they gave their lives so that they might be able to enjoy sharing their faith, talking about their faith, living their faith, and knowing that they would not have to fear repercussions. It's pretty neat, isn't it? 
Because even though we can't say that we're a Christian nation, because we're not a theocracy, we're not, we, do, we don't have a ruler, God is king, but we could say we are a nation who is founded by Christians. We are a nation founded by Christians. Christian men and women who said that we would like to be under God. Christian men and women who, who said to themselves, we would like to establish a more excellent place that has God as its ruler, as its leader. Now one of the things that's true also though is with every Christian there's also a sinner, isn't there? Even as we have founded this country with great ideals and great plans, great opportunities, we know that every one of those Christians who founded the nation, who were part of the founding of the nation, were also sinners. You see, as long as we're on this earth, we are those sinner and saints. We are those who fight and struggle and have that internal struggle inside of us to follow God's law or to give in to our desires and our wants and our pleasures. Constantly fighting within us. Even as we, even as we come to church, even as we, we join to go to the Lord in prayer, we find ourselves at times praying that the Lord would just do what we want Him to do. Asking that the Lord would just follow our direction. And so as more excellent as this country is, it's also an imperfect country because it's full of imperfect people. There's no perfect nation. And just, I don't have to say that to you, do I? Because just look out the windows, look out the doors, look around you. Look in the newspaper or on television. How many scandals have you heard of by politicians, by our leaders, by those who are meant to set an example? But it's not just them, is it? How many of us as the citizens are fall into immorality, fall into that desire that we want things our way. How many of us still see hate and fear, wickedness all around us? How many of us on a regular basis, as Paul commands us in Romans chapter 13, pray for our nation and pray for our leaders? Now, if you go to Romans 13, and I encourage you to double-check me on this, but if you go to Romans 13, you will see that Paul doesn't give us wiggle room. He doesn't say, pray for your leaders when you're happy with them. He doesn't say pray for your leaders when they're doing exactly what they should be doing. He doesn't say pray for your leaders when you voted for them. He says pray for your leaders. Now how many of us as the citizens of the United States spend regular time praying for them? Not just praying that God will convict their hearts and change their minds and change their lives, but actually spend time praying that God would be with them that God would send His Holy Spirit to give them guidance and direction, that God would bless them. You know, we're sinful people, aren't we? We find it hard even as people, as, as part of this more excellent country, we find ourselves regularly falling into sin. We find ourselves regularly caught up in our sinful desires and our sinful wants. We find ourselves failing to pray not only for our leaders, but even for our brothers and sisters. Here we have this great freedom that we need not not fear, but do we take advantage of it? Do we use that freedom that we have to lift up our faith in the public square, to lift up our, our prayers in front of others? No, this this more excellent country is still an imperfect country, isn't it? This more excellent country is still full of imperfect people. People who sin and people who are broken by others' sin. People who fail to follow the true leader's laws. And so when we look at this more excellent country, we know that we desire something greater. How many of us desire something greater than this world? Desire something beyond this world? I don't think you would be here this morning if you didn't believe that God is preparing a most excellent place for us. Not just a more excellent place, but a most excellent place for us. We have faith. We have the promise that we are not only going to be bound on this more excellent country, this imperfect country, but that we have a place prepared for us in heaven. A place where there will not be blood, sweat, or tears. Where there will not be pain or suffering. Well, there will not be loss or death where you cannot be deported. But it's full of God's perfection. Now, that's a scary thought in some ways because when you say, when you look at it, 
Many imperfect people flock into our country every day. There's many imperfect people already here. But in God's perfect country, in God's perfect place, there's no room for imperfection. And that's scary because we are all imperfect. We are all tainted by our sin. And so when we look at that, and when we look at the fact that we would like to spend eternity with God, and His command is perfection, we realize we don't measure up. We realize that God, our just God, looks at every one of our sins and He weighs them against us. Well, we can forget some of our sins. Well, we can disregard some of our sins. He doesn't ever forget. Oh, wait. It's that the psalmist says, as far as the east is from the west, so far does God place our sins from us. See, the psalmist, though, was already talking about what was to come. And that is the one who did shed his blood, sweat, and tears and gave his very life so that we would be made perfect. It, is the, it, was, it was a foreshadowing of what would come in Christ Jesus, who would be the true Savior, the true warrior for our faith, who would go to battle not with a sword, not with power and might, but would go as a lamb led to the slaughter, enduring the sacrifice that His blood might make us perfect. So that His blood might make us, make us available to enter into the heavenly kingdom. And that is exactly what His sacrifice did. It opened to us the gates of everlasting life. It opened uh, to us that place, as we've already sung, of never-ending day, of joy in the presence of the Lord. Not with imperfection, but only in perfection. And what a most excellent country we are being prepared for. What a most excellent country God is shaping us for. He is getting us ready to enter into through the forgiveness of Christ Jesus. This most excellent country, though, as much as we are waiting for it, it doesn't mean that we forget that we are in this more excellent nation now, that we are in this place here on earth now. It does not mean that our heads are permanently in the clouds waiting for the Lord to take us home. And it is a good thing to be looking towards heaven. It is a good thing to be prepared for the day the Lord calls you home, but not, to the way, not by leaving out all the things He still has prepared for us to do on earth. We are a people with a foot in both kingdoms. A people who have a, kingdom, have a foot in, in heaven, prepared for our inheritance already. But we're also a people who still have a foot on this earth. Who are still here to be the people of God. To be His people. Under Him. Under God. Serving God. Fearing God. Loving others. Sharing His word. Proclaiming His gospel. Living out our faith. And what does that mean? What does that mean for us to live out our faith? It means that our prayers, yes, we do pray for our leaders, whether or not we like them. It means that we pray for our enemies. Did you see that in Matthew chapter 5? Jesus didn't say to only pray for your friends, to treat well your friends, but your enemies as well. Because each of your enemies, they're still a potential child of God, aren't they? Because God desires all to be saved. Now I know it's hard. It was hard when the, the first people came to America. It wasn't easy to prepare the land. It wasn't easy to, to, to live here as pioneers. But it was an adventure. And in much the same way, it's an adventure, adventure for us. A difficult adventure for us to share our faith. To share what God has given to us. What He has promised for us. To share that place that He has prepared for us place that he has put his sweat his blood and tears into and it is our adventure to do so it is our adventure to share that one nation as one nation under God that he has prepared a place that is with him a place that with will be that where we will share with him forever so how do we share our faith how do we live out our faith it starts with that prayer but it doesn't stop with that prayer it goes beyond that to what the way we live our lives, to the example we set. It means that we, may, we maybe are going to, at times, speak up when otherwise we would not. It means that at times that we're going to look at Scripture, even when we're tired and when we haven't set aside time to, and when we don't feel like we have energy to, that we're going to turn in God's Word and we're going to see 
those same words of strength, hope, and comfort, it means that we're going to sing his praises, that we're going to join together, whether or not we're sitting here in church or whether we're spread throughout the entire world. And it means that we're going to proclaim the gospel to people who are from Mexico, from China, from Africa, from Asia, from Egypt, to the very ends of the earth, so that all may know that God has prepared the most excellent nation. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, as you now prepare us on this earth to join you forever in heaven, may you each and every day lead us to seek your guidance and direction. May you lead us every day to know the power of your love. And may you lead us every day to seek your forgiveness and your grace. Lord, you are so good to us. You are so merciful. We pray that we would share that love and mercy with others. Help us to proclaim your word, both in our communities here and to the very ends of the earth. Help us to, in this more excellent nation, share the good news that you have defeated death and the devil. That by your sacrifice on the cross, you have paid the price once and for all. So that we, as your people, may enter your kingdom forever in perfection. Until that day comes, may we stand with our foot on this earth, sharing your gospel message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.